Here we are back with the Olmex and the topic of this section of the Olmec art history, introduction, art history, in Mesoamerica talk series is the vulnerability of skin, descriptive modalities, and the violence of state formation. This is the set of art history terms and phrases. So I'm using this lecture series as an introduction to art history. So there's a lot of new terms for people and just kind of learning about how to look at artworks and especially um, how to deal with with difference really like there are many modes of representation and and technologies available to different cultures to represent ourselves and to tell stories and it's paramount to to keep track of um, how we think about and describe difference and and to make sure not to to level level the uh, level the field through uh, through this this history of, of colonization. So if you haven't seen any other talks, we're dealing with the Olmecs, which are in the the modern and contemporary consciousness due to these heads. Um, they are one of the six pristine civilizations of our world. They they developed independently, like Egypt, like Mesopotamia. And they created these heads, and these heads are on our our horizon due due to their descriptive qualities, right? They they, they play a part, and they they play on our um, our art historical canon uh, landscape where where illustrative principles are la are lauded as some epitome with the trajectory from the the Greeks to the Egyptians, right? This is this travesty of our canon where 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 there's there's been this vocabulary that has has allowed us to relegate other forms of of storytelling, and to imagine the history of humanity as these 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 several moments of 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 descriptive descriptive representation as, as some kind of hierarchy. So these uh, the Olmecs lived from 1600 to 300 BC in the, the Gulf Coast of of Mexico in today's uh, Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Their heartland was around the Coatzacoalco River, and uh, they had influence uh, further north to Tlatilco, present-day Mexico City, and, and Guatemala, and they had a lot of firsts. They were the, they're the mother civilization of, of Mesoamerica, the first ball game, the first pyramid, um, you know, the invention of rubber, and, uh, and they, they made 250 or so monumental works that we know about. And you know we're talking about three thousand years ago in the in the jungle, in the low lying tropical jungle. So, so my idea for this talk is is to deal with the fact that it's been decided by academics, by historians, that these are specific leaders, and they're, they're specific people. These these representations of heads. Um, this is a for for anyone's uh, perusal. If you want to kind of take apart and 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 get better at at what it means to sharpen your your art history skills these are terms that are are relevant to this talk um so the idea is that there are specific people and that they're they're representations of leaders and so that that's a this is this is a place where i want to bring art history to the history of being human and and take it um Take it to a place that's really exciting. That isn't just kind of formal descriptions of trends, but but how can art help us solve and and talk about what it means to be human in a, in a in a deep way and and solve problems that we that we face as a society in in a, in a true interdisciplinary fashion. That's my tact. So um, this gentleman on the bottom left is Robert Carnero, who I knew and uh, died recently and was part of the Natural History Museum in New York, um, the South American wing. And he came up with the circumscription theory. There really was not a theory at the time when he came up with it. And um, it's, it's debated, uh, but it, it is a theory and uh, it has a lot of validity. And the idea is that states would not have formed um, this hierarchy of class and and um, you know separating who does what and having an elite leadership. That th this would not have formed simply uh, uh, self self formed right or organically. That it had to have occur occurred through violence. 
And his, his idea is that in addition to that, that there were ecological constraints that required people to stay where they were and resolve their differences and resolve their conflicts. And if, if they could have simply walked 100 miles away and had the same uh, climate and fertility of soil and, and food, um, they, they would have done so. And so the idea is that where these states formed in, our, in the history of our world, where humans began to have cities, um, the, that that was due to an ecological constraint. So on the upper left, you have this, this climate and, uh, and ecosystem of, of the heartland of the Olmec territory. And that's La Venta. That's our, um, our first pyramid on the upper left. And on the right, you have an overgrown site um, further to the, to the northeast uh, of La Venta, where you can see this, the kind of jungle taking over this classic, um, right, maybe a ball court of some kind, a processional architecture. And, uh, and so we can see where they're, they're modifying the, the earth. And, and that's part of the Olmec heritage is they, they, they made a giant ridge. There's these kind of momentous land, land earth movement um, artifacts left, left from them. So were they a state? Um, there's a, a wonderful archaeological project by a professor from the Columbia University in New York, where she took thousands of soil samples from this ridge. And she has determined that based on the artifacts that she found in those soil samples and these cores, um, that yes, this was a stratified culture. There were over 10,000 people, which is the definition of an ancient city. And that, that this is the birth of, of, of civilization in, in Mesoamerica. So we're dealing with a state and we're dealing with leaders in that state. And how did these leaders, how were they able to coerce people and what do their modes of representation have to do with that? And what I'm, what I'm bringing to bear here is, is the idea that uh, a mode of representation of this quality and intelligence um, can be arrived at. There's several archaeologists that believe that the ability to represent things in this illustrative matter, manner, for lack of a better word, um, and it's important to think about these terms, like what is a caricature? What is a illustration? And, and what kind of weight do we give to what is real? What is, what is a real representation? And, and how do we relate to it or approach it as, as something that, that is uh, worthy of dealing with, right? This word dealing, like, uh, you know, like how do we have to pay attention to this thing? And, and does its realism, and how does its realism relate to that? So my trajectory here is to deal with the quality of, of skin and personality. And so the Olmecs chose to, for their largest artworks, their most monumental works, they approached them with a sensitivity that is, that is surprising, that seems like a paradox, um, considering the other languages they had at their disposal. So this picture, these are two pictures of mine from the Mexican uh, Museum in, in uh, the city of Mexico. And these is both of the same head. And these are made from basalt stone that they, they put on rafts and moved. And there's this whole kind of mythology of how they carved this hard stone without metal tools. Um, and, and what kind of sensitivity is this? And so you can see just from a slightly different picture that I took, how the countenance shifts. And, and that speaks to kind of this thing in the round that is experienced um, by, by humans. And so what, not to mention, you know, this is over 3,000, we're, we're close to 3,000 years old. Were these brightly painted? Were there precious stones on them? Were they dressed up with, uh, with textiles? And there's lots, you know, the, the, we're dealing with scraps of the archeological record from the archeological record to put together who this civilization was. So I have this slide to deal with just the, the fact that our history is kind of about recognizing differences and humans have an incredible ability to recognize differences and AI is, is working on that. But even in the medical field, uh, the ability to, to, to look at slides of cancerous cells and determine whether, whether there is cancer there is still, it's still by inspection. Um, our eyeballs, our rods and cones have an incredible ability to recognize small differences. And so on the left, I have this example of these, these wasps, these, these Western wasps and, and the differences in their backs uh, representing either species or, or gender, or, or I don't really know, I'm an amateur naturalist. But um, the point is that there's these slight variations that we pick up on and that have, that have meaning. 
And so part of art is, is deciding how unique or general to, to make a thing. Is this person on the right a neighbor or is it one of 20 neighbors? Is it a generalized 40 year old person or, or is this a very specific person? And this is to us. So part of art history is that we're dealing with, um, there's this great historian, uh, TJ Clark, and he talks a lot about recreating history, dragging, dragging time back um, to now. And so, so we're dealing with that. We have to be sensitive to that. What do these things mean to us now? And what did they mean to us in the 60s? And what did they mean to us? You know, now that they've been, they, we've been, they've been mediated, um, they've become media, they've, uh, they, 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 they've become part of our consciousness through a plethora of images, right? And now me talking about them, um, this meaning is not, uh, is flexible. And so, so when we deal with history, this old, um, it, it's quite a lot of hubris and ego to imagine that we know what these things mean or meant. So I'm going to move through this trajectory of talking about within Western art, right? Because we're dealing with primitivism. The minute that we start talking about an ancient culture from Mesoamerica that has been neglected and relegated as um, you know, when they were first discovered in 1856, these heads were considered Ethiopian. There, there's no way that they could have been made in Mesoamerica. It must be Africans or it must be Polynesians or, um, you know, there's this, this prejudice, this, this racism that exists regarding methods of portraying and representing ourselves in, in the world. And so I'm going to work within that by by talking about Western art and Western painting and using using that lens. And so so what does that lens do to Mesoamerican work? And, and so, so that's a question that's worth just, just having. And so I'm showing a piece from the 1500s in Italy by Bernini. And, and here we have humans desiring and having the ability, having the intelligence and, the, and, and wanting to take something hard like stone and make it soft. What is that? Why, why do we want to do that? And, and that's, a, that's a beautiful poetic ability that we have to 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 metamorphosize to to imagine the the world as other than what it is and so that's one aspect of this image i want to talk about but the other is is part of this 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 topic which is what kind of sensitivity does that stone now have what kind of vulnerability what kind of uh, propensity for being injured and uh and and how do we relate to it how do, how do we sense its vulnerability in relation to our own as 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 humans with with skin and bodies. So this is to show, so we have the Olmec head on the left and, and you know, these are close to six feet tall. They're very dense, they're very heavy. Um, and then like imagine a Volkswagen bug from the seventies and, and some of these heads are 25 tons. Imagine 25 Volkswagen bugs, but compressed into, this, into the scale of one of them, right? That, that, that's the weight that we're, we're, we're talking about here that that has been given and imbued with a a sensitivity of skin uh, over over 2000 you know close to 3000 years ago now on the right we have a, a work that's from an olmec it's considered olmec influence it's hard to know you know part of the problem with this record this archaeological record is that there was an intense pressure on the antiquities market and so many these were stolen by looters a lot of the small objects from mesoamerica and they were sold in Hollywood particularly, and they cropped up in people's homes around the world and um, finding out where they actually were. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tragic, tragic history all the way. If we talk about Hernan Cortez and the conquistadors and, and how they, they took all these objects as gifts and they simply brought them back to Spain and, and, and melted them down into gold as, as money. Right. Um, so we could meditate on that for a minute, but let's let's not. Um, so on our right, we have uh, this this Olmec influenced piece from from North from Puebla, and these are these white ceramics, hollow body, and there's a whole set of these, a theme of this. And and what I'm asking for you to do is to look at this and tell me how unique of an object this is. What 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 does the word caricature mean? Like how illusionistic? What what does illusionism have to do with uniqueness? So, so the irony is that the Olmecs had this language at their disposal. And, and I'm going to say, I don't find this face as particular. I feel like I have, this might be two or three of my neighbors. And, and the, the heads, the grandness of the heads, and maybe it's just simply because of that paradox of the scale, but there's a, 
a tremendous specificity for the scale and uh, to these to these large heads that is uh, is remarkable and 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 there must have been purposes for that right there there's a decision to decide to specify on that scale these are other means at their disposal this is from Tatilco closer to modern day Mexico city north of the heartland of the Olmecs um this is part of this group of I think these are solid bodied clay works that are part of uh, they're called the uh, happy ladies I believe um so this is a technology this is a technology of of representation of representing a face and a, and a body of something to be hold, to be held maybe or, or buried um as part of an offering or 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 uh, I don't think we really know exactly what these were for, but I'm just using them to express that there were other technologies. Why not make your leader use use these devices as 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 a representation instead of what we saw? Um, what we what we're seeing is these very specific uh, features of the nose and the, and the face and the eyes. So here's on a, on another level, and this is a beautiful uh, Olmec work um, again from from the north of the of the heartland um but they think that maybe they were Olmec craftsmen that, that worked up there um so let's look at this piece so how, how does this piece operate one of the beautiful things about this this piece is that this this shape has been turned upside down to become a mouth right and so we have this bilateral symmetry that has this beautiful curve of the neck and the and the face on each side and then we can see that there's an understanding of this this arabesque or, or or this kind of parentheses repetition as as sign as symbol for a referent which is eyebrow but how how close does the symbol have to do with this caricature or or illusionistic concept of our retinal vision of eyebrow and and what is this idea of eyebrow right for this kind of double personality mythical figure um and then to, to bring it to another level of symbolism right i'm just trying to break down these different ways of representing forms that we have available to us and 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 or that the the Olmecs had available to them from my perspective now looking back in history right this is a complicated affair to 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 experience and 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 give give credit and and give uh give time uh to to witness these objects and what they are so this is this uh this beautiful rendition of, of hair, right? It looks like a hair to me. Um, and, and we know as humans that this is a stand-in for hair, but it doesn't have the same um, representational and symbolic qualities maybe as something like, uh, let's look at another Bernini um, image. Um, like what about this representation of hair? Okay, and then what about this is just for fun? I'm kind of ad libbing a little bit here. Um, yeah, what what is the difference between those, between that representation of hair and this representation of hair? And and is one one more about language than eyes? Is that even a fair question to to throw out there? Um, so the point is that the Olmecs had different methods of, of representing the human form at their disposal. And for these leaders, for these monumental, heavy objects, they chose something quite compassionate and sensitive. And there's there's a there's a paradox there that the meaning of these of these works can turn during the birth of the civilization as a state, with where where there, there, there's an ideology imposed where there were groups of people that had to slowly sand these objects and that were hired or or enslaved or, or how how did they how were they coerced according to this circumscription theory and and going anthropological theories about humans coming together in civilization you know how how were they convinced that it was a good idea to work for these people and what does the vulnerability of the skin have to do with that that this is the idea i'm throwing out there so i'm going to show um, uh, part of the topic of this and art history is dealing with primitivism and um, what is primitivism right we could we could talk about it from a European standpoint and these ideas of Gauguin and um, these painters Gauguin going to Polynesia or or Picasso dealing with African sculptures and this kind of uh, relationship to colonization and kind of upholding the primitive as something special and at the same time using it to, to knock it down and say that the West is better. So this is a whole complicated topic of our history that's 
it's 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 a section, and I, I just want to to interest into the introductory class. These are topics that, that you should know about. And so this is an African artwork uh, from the Ife people, and and um, it's a representation of a head. And I just want to you know this is from 12, 1200 A.D. and um, you know, here's another point with our history that's worth looking at. So are these the same pieces? Is this the same piece? What are the differences? And that's that's what I mean by recognizing differences. And, and from that initial slide of, um, and what happens in our memory to those differences? And what do we hold on to as a, as a people in our current time? And what have we been trained to, to notice as, in, as important when we look at objects and our world? And so, you know, we, we, we might notice, oh, there's, there's some holes here on this piece here. And I don't, I don't see them on, on this piece, you know, and especially with the internet, maybe just because there's no, you know, just because this has been cut out on the, and, and pasted on a white screen, we don't, maybe, maybe that was cut off. Maybe this top um, piece was cut off. So, so I'm just, I'm just elaborating our, our elaborating our visual acuity. And our ability to 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 be patient and watchful and and recognize these things, these differences. Um, this is a beautiful piece from 100 BC to 500 AD of the Mochi Peruvians. Um, the Peruvians are one of the other pristine civilizations of New America. Um, so there's six pristine civilizations. We have the Olmecs and the Peruvians. It was thought that they were communicating. And, and so then it wouldn't be considered a pristine civilization. The idea is that these civilizations grew without outside influence. But in fact, there's, um, there's evidence that these, these two cultures, um, the Peruvians and the, you know, the Andes and the uh, Olmecs came about um, on their own. So these are, these are images of cultures that, you know, from this primitivist thread that have been primitivized by, by the West as kind of backwards or whatever. And so I'm just showing these are examples of, of an illustrative principle that you would not associate with that historical um, analysis, those chains of, 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 of the canon. And uh, it's the, the, the chains of the canon are, um, I just came up with that. I don't know if that's a great way to talk about it, but the, the chains of the canon are, are uh, have such a, a tight, a surprisingly tight grip on, on what we decide is is worth looking at and paying attention, and uh, and it, we we need to do all that we can to to allow allow difference into our lives. Um. Okay, so I'm going to keep going here with this idea of of what was available to the Olmecs. So part of this proof is that. These are monuments that were found next to the heads from the same time period. They're slightly smaller. They're made from basalt stone also, but we have a completely different technology. Um, this one also is from that time period. Uh, we have a completely different technology being used. And how does this skin feel to you? Of course, it's been weathered and pocked by, by time and environmental conditions, but do these feel as personable, as approachable as as the grandness, um, as as the heads the heads that I've shown previously do? And also, it's worth noting that there's a combination of descriptive technologies being used in this. Right, this this is acceptable for some reason to this culture to to elaborate on the figure in this manner, and to use incision and more of a graphic representation for the hands, and to to use another move here, right? These are different moves. These are different um, chess moves in the in the sculptor and culture's uh, decision-making uh, algorithm, sequence of events to, to produce something. Um, so the question is, yeah, what what is the personability? Uh, will you vote for this man, right? Like if he, you know, is 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 as a as a leader. Um, but really, there's the weight, and and this is in incandescent. So this is another thing of our history. These have been taken, deterritorialized. I think is the term. Like they've been they've been ripped. They've been uh, removed from their setting, and they're in a museum. And there's incandescent lights. And what do they look like now under under that situation? And why do we want to look at them in that way? And why do we think that's a way of holding on to to what they mean? These are all. This is intro to art history. This is this is what this is. These are about um, these images. 
So this is the Jaguar motif that is super common in Olmec and has become kind of the sign of Olmec um, ideas, even though it's not really clear how much it looks like a Jaguar versus a Cayman, the, the kind of alligator type reptile that it lives in that jungle. Um, so so this is this is a form during the same time period. So this is a culture that that could anthropomorphize, right? Which is which is which is something humans like to do, which is kind of give animals human qualities and humans animal qualities. And uh, for these anthropomorphic godlike figures, there's a symbolism, right? This is considered where where maize grows from, and this downturned lips is the the classic Olmec move. And we have a a thing, a an object here that uh, that speaks a very different attachment to me right now and with my world of, of, of what I have experienced as real uh, compared to this this other thing. And so 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 that's interesting, right? This this thing, both of these, I believe, have traveled around the world in museum shows, but but this particularly has a has a very strange relationship to modernism and the the human consciousness, uh, modern human consciousness of, of being seen. And uh, it has a lot of political factors involved with it being shown in the United States when it was in the 60s and um, and earlier. So this is another form from the same time period, right? This is a language of representation. These were supposedly articulated arms maybe that were in here. And um, this is a monument form. Again, there's close to 250 of these, the, the um, monument type things that have been found. And uh, it's different than the way the head is described, right? We don't we don't know what kind of leather or fabric or textile or this is, but when we look at one of those heads, there's a sense that that skin has seen sun and light, and and this is without any, you know, this is after close to close to three thousand years of of environmental conditions outside um, that we're getting that sense. I'm going to imagine that it was more like that um, from far, from uh, closer to that time period as we go back and as we go closer to the time when it was made. Um, so as I, as I follow this art, Western art has had this idea that the break in contemporary painting and sculpture, Western contemporary painting and sculpture had to do with Mademoiselle d'Avignon painting and this analytic cubism of Picasso. And, and we, 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 we've, we've broken through from morphology and illusionism, and we're into the the world of abstraction and Cezanne, and so there's this whole. So this is all something to know about in our history, right? We have this this idea of painting the form and the figure in in the 20th century and the 19th century in Europe, and um, this kind of looking back to the Renaissance, and then this this idea of break, the idea of a crisis in art that's part of our history, also. So this is Mademoiselle d'Avignon. These are these figures that you know people want to say have an African feel. Picasso has African masks in his studio. And so it's part of this primitivist thing of, of using, of colonizing, of using another, you know, using something from outside of our world to find inspiration. And 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 that's part of this talk. We're, we're dealing with uh, talking about a, a, a Mesoamerican culture that uh that has been relegated right um in the history of art and so now there's another idea that the break in the this in this arc of, of modern art was not in that painting but was in this this mask in relation to this 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 scribble mask in relation to this guitar and that these kind of collage sculpture paper things of picasso's um, where was that this is the real break in Western painting and that it had to do with language and sign. So I'm using this to to help show different ways of reading objects other than this thing that has such a tight grip on us, which is that it's, you know, the photorealism, the illustration is the epitome of some kind of representational technology, which is just not the case. It's a it's a tragedy and we need to continually deal with that for some reason. Um, and that's interesting in of itself. So what what is happening here? The idea is that the sign doesn't have the relationship you might have thought to the thing that it represents. So there's this idea of morphology. That's another art vocabulary term of the, the idea that an eye should be round because it's round in in this world. And and the idea of this break in contemporary modern art is that a, a volume, an empty volume, could represent a solid. That these these eye protrusion cylinders 
um, could represent eye sockets. And, and then from there, there becomes this interchangeability of the sign where, which is what we saw and how I talked about for, for various reasons why I talked about the fact that there's this intelligence of flipping this thing, this eye form upside down as the mouth. So we enter this place where there's a, there's an interchangeability of signs. So that's considered this, this break and being able to see um, other ways of, of talking about and looking at, at, at how things function when we represent them to ourselves and our community and our, our culture. Um, so um, we're gonna move forward here with, with Persian miniatures. This is a beautiful Persian miniature. And when I was in school and and I saw Persian miniatures, um, I had this this voice in my head from people like Gombrich and other art historians and the trajectory of um, of perspective. And and this gentleman, um, Piero della Francesca, Cesco, who was used by modernist paintings in Abex in the in the 60s in in New York. The, the, this this artist was dug up as some kind of icon for for learning about abstraction, which is which is interesting because he is the epitome with this gentleman Al, Alberti from Italy, and they came up with this idea of the window space for representing forms in painting in in Italian art, and they came up with perspective, and that became the the norm, right? And this idea of trompe l'oeil and and the story of a of a fly landing on a grape, and that's like oh the the, the the that's in a painting, right? There's a painting of grapes, and this fly lands, and it's real, and and oh my gosh, the painting's so real that a fly thought it was real. This is this this very funny story about 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 real realness in 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 art, right? And and to 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 prove something about this uh, this window and this uh, technology of of the Renaissance. So I'm trying to to talk about the technologies as ideologies, not as um, not as truths, right? There, there, there is no no truth in art. These are these are fictions. These are uh, invented realities. That there, this is paint, right? And and we decide how quickly to be duped into believing it's real or not. It's up to up to us in that moment whether to pay attention to this and how important it may or may not be. So from art history, we have all these terms from, from Renaissance painting that get carried into our schooling when we learn how to draw and paint and when we learn about art history. So we, of course, Cortescuro, I don't know how to pronounce that, but the idea of like shadow falling on forms. Um, we have orthogonals, we have uh, atmospheric space. Um, we have this, this window idea. And so then you, you, you're in the library and you look at a, a Persian miniature and you say, you say, wait a minute, like, why is this not represented in space? Why doesn't that have an orthogonal? Why is this gentleman larger than the people in the foreground? This this is not this is not this 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 evolution that was that was written about in the art canon of of uh, of some kind of cultural uh, evolution. Um, uh, and it's 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 amazing that it held so much sway as long as it did. Um, but the idea here is that there are other there are other thoughts at stake there's uh, this is to be read differently um and and there are uh, it's it's a different kind of technology not to be compared right um the irony is that here i am comparing in order to make sense of this this art canon idea but um yeah so i'm going to show a you know and I I went and studied these Piero della Francesca paintings. I drew from them obsessively, and I thought that they were the the you know the I I bought this idea um, about them in some ways. Um, I found them quite beautiful, and I still do. But the point is that the the way in which they claim some reality of representation as the only way is worth looking at. That 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 is very worth looking at. The way that these seem to claim that this is the way reality is should be represented to us is a very subtle idea that uh, that has uh, intense implications for for governing and the state these are examples of painting technology from mesoamerica this is these are the teotihuacanans we're going to talk about this in the next next section the teotihuacan paintings are unbelievable 
Um, they, uh, and they, they show all kinds of technologies within single artworks and within the this, this single site of Teotihuacan, which is near Mexico City. You may have seen the giant pyramids, um, some of the largest um, architecture in the world. And um, these are paintings from that, from that site. And so, so now that we've kind of talked about the architecture, the technology of representation, we will be able to look at these with more, um, more belief than, than we would have before, I, I think. This is another example of, of their, their paintings. And so this is, uh, this is long after the Olmec. So here we have a, a monument. So let's get back into this idea of, of skin and sensitivity and leadership. And how unique is this person on the left? How unique is this person on the right? What are the modes of representation that were used? And the, the guy on the left is George Washington, the Washington Monument in the United States. And it's large, <laughs> it's larger than life. But how vulnerable is this character? to us now and to, again, this is TJ Clark idea of reaching back in history, where are we now and how are we perceiving this thing? But there's signifiers, right? He had dentures, that's a whole other terrible, scary story. Um, and so that's a signifier of George Washington and then the hair and and maybe something about this note. Like, so, so again, it's this idea of the human ability and the animal ability to recognize unique small differences and, and we decide that there's a general, you could also think about this as the, the letter A, right? You can write the letter A many different ways. It's still A. There's many ways to write this face of George Washington. It's still recognized as George Washington to a group of people, to some collective group. And that's fascinating in and of itself. So this is an art history moment here of, of recognizability in a, in a retinal visual, visual way, of course. Um, and so I'm kind of claiming like those eyelids could be one of my neighbor's eyelids. Maybe they're not particular or specific um, to, to George Washington. So to me, there's nothing surprising about this work. Its generality makes sense with the distance I am from it, with its scale. To me, to me, it seems like um, it seems like an appropriate amount of generality to its scale. Whereas the device in the Olmec heads is shocking to me in that a, a thing at which I would think I would be removed from, I feel compassionate and able to approach. Um, on our right, we have this Chuck Close painting, which, which we looked at as a class, if you haven't seen this yet, um, painter from the 60s, incredible painter. And what's beautiful about these is we have these small moments, these abstract moments that seem lazy, maybe you could say, or just for fun, you could say lazy, but they, they, could, they seem quite flippant or general. They're these very, um, let's see if I can zoom in here. Uh, yeah, they're very loose gestural abstraction. That's an art history term that kind of these, uh, these painterly wet paint on wet paint moments. Uh, I don't know if this is oil or acrylic. And um, Yet from far away, this accrual of, of generalizations becomes something specific. Um, you know, who is this figure? Is, is she somebody you know? Is she someone that you might remember? Is she, you might see someone that looks like her today. I think this is a fun way of, of thinking about portraiture and painting and art and, uh, and how we choose to represent ourselves. So then to, to bring us back to the Olmecs, Two pictures of the same head again to bring up the idea of recognizing differences. One natural light, one uh, fluorescent light, both taken from context, uh, put on a pedestal or a podium, and uh, one put in a, in a black background. And, and do, does the countenance look different? See how subtle it is, how, how we're looking below the right figure a little bit? I, I It's... it's it's stunning to me the way these shift as you move around them. It looks to me as if the, the figure is animated with slightly different, slightly different angles. So this is part of our history. We're just looking at things together, looking at things and talking about them. It's, uh, 
it's awesome that way. Uh, here's a monument. Um, what is the, what is your sense of approachability? Can you ask this guy for a dollar? Um, can you ask him how to get to the to the local store? Uh, or is he kind of a stern father figure for us? Um, you know, what what kind of vulnerability does this gentleman have? Uh, and 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 can we talk about can we talk about now um, the idea of governance and and representation? And uh, and ideology, these terms that I just keep keep saying without maybe specifying them enough, other than through these images. But maybe that's the point: is to kind of kind of leave leave them for you to to think about. Here's freeze technology, this this beautiful method of representing space in this kind of uh, in this very thin sphere, right? Um, in this thin dimension. So there's an economical, there's an economy to to how much in the round you can get on a flat surface, right? Freeze, freeze speaks between between flat and in the round. So it, it can talk about both, which is which just gives it a lot of power and uh, and it's it's kind of architectural relief. Freeze quality is it can be magical the way light plays on it and the way that things are real but are red. Um, so yeah, so to talk about the Egyptians evolving into the Greeks pictorially uh, is, uh, well, I'll let you fill in all the words after I've spoken and you can tell me how you feel about it. Um, this is a, a teacher of mine from, from college, Tom Haxo, and it's just, I'm just showing representations. This is a sculpture of a person. Does this feel like a friend? Does it feel like someone you want to know? Does it feel like someone you'll never know? Um, can how about this? Can you judge this person? Can you can you make stereotypes about what this person thinks about or feels? And is that a measurement of uniqueness? What is a what is a measurement of uniqueness with with the detail of representation? I guess one thing. So this is clearly clay. That's not hidden from us. It's not hidden from us that this was made with hands. Does that lend a quality of, of approachability to it? Um, is that what, what it means? Is that what character means? And, and strangely, does this feel similar? Is there a, a quality that, that we know this was made by a hand? And, and, and what does that mean? So I'm just throwing out food for thought here. This was a peer of mine in graduate school. Um, and uh, these are his sculptures, um, George George Rodriguez. And uh, yeah, I'm just talking about faces and people and figures and um, and how we relate to them culturally. And lastly, I just want to bring up this Arnolfini wedding portrait from the 1400s, the Northern European, because um, I think he's a uh, he's a good place to look at. Um, you know, I've been talking about how the objects are chosen to be made in different ways, how the the, scu the sculpture and the culture decides to represent um, to represent these things. Sorry. That's the that's the next class. Um, and uh, the thing about the Arnolfini portrait is that you can feel yourself being positioned. So the point is that the works are not simply doing something to us, right? We we are bringing our whole our whole baggage. We're bringing all, all that we are to the artwork when we when we come to it, and 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 when we walk around it, we are being held and positioned by it. And so if you look at like a contemporary artist like Bruce Nauman, to some degree, he's dealing with that, with the control uh, between the viewer and the experience. And, and there's a way you could make that leap to, to this work where, 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 how am I held for, for the moment of experiencing this work? In what degree does perspective and realism of the technology of this time, what does that do to my sentiments? What does that, what does that do to how I decide to think about where I'm standing um, this is a subtle idea that it's, it's, it's difficult to express. And, and I hope throughout 
throughout um, art history talks, I can I can make it more more clear. 